There is a secret passage from the basement of the extermination building to the royal treasury. Still who's asked, in disbelief, as we gallop towards the Celestian Monument, our weapons and most of our supplies floating in tow behind me. Yep, don't make sense to me either. Seems that would be the sort of place you wouldn't want a, a secret ways into, Clement responded, gliding along the side of us. But, is what the map had on the terminal aid. I was still reeling from the knowledge of whose office I had stepped set hoof in, whose terminal I had managed to break into. Velvet and Calamity had laid down in HER bed. After her sister Luna had taken the throne, after Littlehorn, she had spent a lot more time at her school than in the castle. As we reached the monument, we slowed our pace. Most of the Alicorns were on the far side of the Ministry Walk. My EFS was picking up hostiles close enough to worry about, even in the rugged, fading light of dusk. We needed stealth now. The Celestian Monument was magnified even after centuries of decay had uh, taken bits out of its structure, leaving patches of framework bare. I stopped a moment to stare in awe, then bowed before it, sending a prayer to the goddess. I heard the sound of static. It was growing steadily louder. A sprite bot was approaching from the front side of the monument, its speakers broadcasting white noise and necromonic death. My vision fuzzed, and my head began to throb for what seemed like the infinitieth time that evening. We were just on the edge of the effect now, and we started stepping back to keep from being engulfed. I was useless against the ghouls and zombies created by the pink cloud, and nearly as helpless against alicorns. But this was a threat that I alone was equipped to handle. I was the only one with a ranged weapon that was quiet. I floated out the zebra rifle down its sights, and tracking the approaching robot by its friendly light on my EFS compass. Waiting for it to float into sight, poof, poof, poof. the sprite bot dropped to the ground, internally, internal circuits burning, its broadcast dying with a pop of ozone. We trotted past it, ignoring the scrap. Well, most of it did. Calamity picked it up and offered it to steel hooves, remembering the ranger's armor used scrap metal to repair itself. The outside grounds of Zelestia's school had been blissfully vacant. Any pony outside had fled to the safety of the buildings when the pink cloud came. Now that the buildings had proven sufficiently safe. As we rounded one of the mighty wings of the Celestian Monument, we saw that the Ministry Walk had not fared so well. There were skeletons scattered all about the fields, sinking into the ground like black weeds. Ponies had filled the park when the pink cloud consumed it. A stallion whose bow tie and collar had become permanently part of his neck. A twisted framework of a baby carriage with the skeleton of the baby Pegasus pony welded onto it. The infant's mother lying half inside the cobble steps nearby. A mare who had been sitting on a park bench in a most peculiar fashion, her skeleton now melded into the bench itself, holding her to that pose forever. Two ponies fused together in an eternal embrace. Their skulls tilted upwards in the direction of the pink horror that had descended upon them, snuffling out the twin flames of love and life. This is too much, Velvet Remedy groaned. Then she gasped in horror, stopping dead, staring ahead of us. The Ministry of Peace, the Catalot hub of Fluttershy's ministry, had been built into a grove of magically grown trees. Two hundred years ago, it would have been a heartwarming vision of natural beauty. But the pink cloud had murdered the trees, turning them into twisted black terrors, the whole building looking like a haunted house. Small objects littered the cobblestones and lifeless planters that circled the ministry, scissors, ashtrays, metal picture frames, all objects sucked out of the rooms whose windows had shattered. Parts of the terminal lay smashed on the steps just outside the front doors and a ceramic butterfly had shattered into several pieces, scattered across the rows of the dead hedges. As we crept forward, Velvet Omendi hesitated. I... I don't think I want to see any more. I don't want to know what this poisoned place has done to Fluttershy. 
Velvet paused to look at the corner diorama featuring Fluttershy sitting in a forested field, surrounded by gentle animals. I could guess she was uh, struggling against the urge to shatter the display and steal the full-sized Fluttershy for herself. Are you okay? I... I just can't take away her away from all her forested friends. Velvet whined softly. The Ministry of Peace had suffered severe internal damage when the trees that formed most of its outer walls had twisted in their natural death. Pink Cloud had seeped into all but the most interior rooms. To our further dismay, the Cantalot Hub seemed to be less of a place for healing and medical research than a public front and administrative center for the other MOP hubs. We were coming up empty hoofed in our search for medicine. The only upside is that nothing in the Ministry of Peace had attacked us yet. Everything in this place was dead. I approached a set of double doors and nudged it open. Well, Remedy looking over my soldier, whining in dismay. A haze of deep pink filled the massive room, which had once been an auditorium. Rows of rotting seats descending towards a dilapidated stage beneath the last dangling threads of cloud-eaten curtains. The walls, formed from even more trees, were blackened and dead. Love Remedy inexplicably pushed past me and galloped into the poisoned room. Velvet! What you doing, girl? Get yourself out of there! Velvet paid us no attention, charging up to the stage and jumping onto it. I saw her waver as she landed, the pink cloud beginning to get to her. I shouted for her to come back. Beside me, Pyrelet called out, calling to her beloved Velvet. What in tarnation does she think she's doing? Calamity demanded. Velvet stumbled, turning, and standing before the podium. She put a hoof on it, and it broke apart at her touch. I could hear her sob. The auditorium still had great acoustics. Seeing her standing on the stage, wearing her yellow medical boxes, I suddenly realized this wasn't just any auditorium. That wasn't just any stage. Um, hello? Velvet Remedy said meekly, reciting from memory. Can I have your attention? Please, if you don't mind. Oh, goddesses. Hold on, little pip. I'm a grabber. Thank you, Velvet was saying. Now, um, I know every pony is really, really busy, so I'll try not to take too much of your time. Calamity, wait, I said, holding up a hoof. A power light fluttered at the edge of the pink, hooting in agitation. Wait? He spun at me fiercely. She's gone plumb off a rocker. She'll die in there if we wait. I focused, wrapping Velvet Remedy my magic. I'll pull her out. Just... I think maybe she needs to do this. She was risking her life to do this. And I couldn't tell if she was on the road to... Catharsis or Catatonia. I don't know what that means. Needs to do what? Climater demanded. Pyrelite didn't wait. The Balefire Phoenix soared into the poison, flying to Velvet Remedy. Below us, Velvet Remedy continued, her inflection perfectly matching Fluttershy's. Princess Luna has given us, that is, she's allowed us to, we have a new project. Velvet paused, looking out over the crowd only to see that only existed in her mind, as Pyrelite landed by her forehooves and rubbed against her, nudging her to move. This is bad. Silas told me. Velvet cringed slightly. Please, it's okay. I know we're all overworked, and every pony has so much to do already, and you're all doing just wonderful. She gave a most beautiful smile. Oh, what in the hay? Clamity moaned. Pyrelite began to cough. I extended my magic around her, too, feeling increasingly anxious. Did she need this? Would she ever forgive me if I pulled her out? Denied her this? Did it matter? But, this is really important. I've been talking with Princess Luna and... Velvet fell to her knees, coughing, her voice getting weaker as she struggled to breathe. I really, really want to do this project. I'm behind it. She coughed again. Completely. And I really hope you will be too. 
This horrible, terrible war has gone on far, far too long and hurt so many people. I could hear the sadness and hurt in Velvet Emin's weakened voice. Sweet merciful Celestia, I could see her tears. Enough of this, Clemmy growled. Little Pip, get her out of there now. I nodded, blinking back tears of my own. From your lips to Celestia's ears, I whispered as I levitated Velvet Remedy and pulled my friend from that gas chamber. Velvet Remedy was barely in a condition to move, much less walk, even after I had fed her our last healing potion. We left her in the care of Pyrolax and Steel Hooves. Mind telling me what the hell that was all about? Clamity asked angrily as he flew above me in the maze of office cubicles I was wading through. The Fluttershy Orb, I told him. I heard a crunch and felt a sharp pain in my left forehoof. Looking down, I saw that I had stepped on the skeletal remains of some small creature. I stopped, leaning against a cubicle wall as I telekinetically pulled a thorn-shaped bit of broken bone from my hoof, which beat it with blood. There were other little skeletons all over the floor. That auditorium. That was the room where Fluttershy was talking to her ministry ponies in the memory orb. Velvet Remedy was reciting it. Or reliving it. Or something. And that struck you as something we ought to let her keep doing? Clamity snapped. I... I don't know. Velvet's a performer. I don't think that was... I hope that was just her doing a performance. Her one chance to be on Fluttershy's stage. But I turned to my Pegasus friend. The first friend I ever really had. Fluttershy's ministry created the mega spells, Calamity. I admitted to him. Whoa! Calamity stopped in midair, hovering. Say what now? They were originally intended as mass healing spells. She never meant for them to be used as weapons of death. Clemity groaned. Velvet. She doesn't know yet, but sooner or later she's going to find out. And when that happens, do you think it'll be any easier if we had denied her the chance to do whatever she was doing? Fuck. Clemity bucked around the cubicle walls, punching his hoof through it. We moved on. The office is quiet, except for the background music of Calamity's rummaging through desk and filing cabinets. The air in here was clear, if musty and old. Yet it felt like the pink cloud was all around us, eating at my friends, its corrosion seeping even into our friendships. We had made our way through the door, without taking, talking again, past the cubicles and the smaller offices, until we reached a curving yellow hallway. The inner curve was a simple wooden door, the frame around it covered in a little birdhouse. Along the bottom of the door were several smaller doors, as if designed for little creatures to move in and out as they pleased. Along the outer curve were two pairs of stately arched double doors made of polished mahogany. These two had little animal doors built into them. The far side was open, but all I could see was of the room was part of the wall. The curve of the hall prevented me from seeing the far end, but I didn't need to. Just beyond the open doors, there was a sign mounted on the hallway ceiling, the glass plate reading, Elevators, still black lit by a slightly flickering light. I checked my EFS for any signs of hostility, but the whole floor was dead. Nudging Calamity, I suggested, let's finish up, I want to get out of here. You take that door, I motioned to the small peculiar inner door. I'll take these. Clemity nickered unhappily, but flew ahead to the smaller door. I was wagering that an office designed to allow small animals was less likely to have dangerous defenses, not that I was expecting anything threatening from either room. The Ministry of Peace had been entirely, even eerily, peaceful. I watched as Calamity opened the door to the inner office. It wasn't even locked. I then shifted to the closest set of mahogany double doors. Inside was a meeting room, dominated by a rich table crafted exquisitely from the same mahogany as the doors. Chairs were overturned, papers and folders were scattered. The opposite wall was dominated by a huge picture window that stared out over the pink tainted ministry walk. The room held a single skeleton. 
that of a mare whose body dangled from the window, a forehoof melted into the glass. There were imperfections radiating away from her hoof, cracks in the window which had fused back together before the pressure outside could grow enough to blow the window, window in. Once beautiful saddle purse hung rotting from her bones, the bottom having torn away, dumping its contents on the floor. Was that Fluttershy? My heart sank, a knot forming in my throat. I stepped closer, eyes fixed on the skeleton, only to run to the table. Somehow, part of me was sure that it was Fluttershy, that she had... No, wait. I felt a flood of relief as I realized it wasn't the kindly yoga little pegasus after all. It couldn't be. No wing bones. A horn. This was a unicorn. Probably a secretary, or a nurse. Possibly a caretaker of Fluttershy's animals while she was away but not Fluttershy herself. As I walked around the table to get a closer look, I spied the far end of the wall where a chalkboard hung between two monitors. The meeting room had been designed for multimedia presentations. Amongst the strange diagrams, the chalkboard bore four words written in bold yellow chalk, save that the first letter of each word was pink. Communally assured Reciprocal, reciprocal existence. Care. I felt weak. Oh. Oh, poor Fluttershy. I stumbled and sat in the chair. The chair promptly fell apart, dumping me onto the floor. Blinking, I found myself looking between the table's legs and the hind hoofs of the dangling skeleton and the collection of rubbish that had fallen from her purse. Amongst the decaying garbage lay a statuette, still pristine, of a yellow pegasus pony surrounded by birds and butterflies, a small family of chipmunks and a white rabbit. She was smiling at them sweetly from behind a curtain of her pink mane, a look of gentle caring in her eyes. I got up, walking closer until I could see, be pleasant, the final of the Ministry Mayor statuettes. I now had a full set. Only, I wasn't going to keep this one. I knew a unicorn who needed her more than I did. Besides, wouldn't it be wrong for corrupted kindness to be carrying around a statuette of the bearer of the element of kindness? Wouldn't I be dishonoring her somehow? So it was, with every intention of giving Fluttershy a statuette to build remedy, that erected him a magic and everything changed. I felt a surge of magic, like with the others, but this time, it was accompanied by something more, something greater. As I lifted the Fluttershy statue up before me, I knew that I was going to keep her, not out of selfishness, not because it was something I wanted or I felt I deserved. The statuettes wanted to be together. The ministry mayors needed to be together. They were meant to be. Fluttershy, Rainbow Dash, Pinkie Pie, Twilight Sparkle, Rarity, Applejack. They were stronger when they were together. Better. Separating them had been the worst thing any pony could have ever done to them. I knew that. And now that I brought them together again, I knew I just couldn't separate them. Calamity dumped out the medical supplies he had found. I found Fluttershy's personal office, he told Velvet Remedy. And no, before ye yeah, ask, she wasn't there. She left all this. Velvet Remedy's eyes, or her smiled, and her eyes, eyes started to sparkle. It was as if Fluttershy herself had sent the supplies we needed just for us. Cabinets weren't even locked, Calamity commented. Velvet began sorting through the medicine. Calamity simply grabbed everything. I recognized super restoration potions and healing potions. Enough to get us through three canter lots with some to spare. Painkillers, too. Most of the rest, however, were beyond my ken. Veterinarian medicine, Velvet Remedy explained, dividing the pills for animals from the drugs for ponies. Then she took a few of the former pile. For pyrolate, just in case. 
Parla gave an exaggerated hacking sound, and then shot Velvet a challenging look. Oh, you'll take your medicine if I give it to you, Velvet shot back, her eyes narrowing, but smiling nevertheless. I have enough problem patience with these ponies. Flourish's office was more like an office for a doctor than a head of a whole branch of the equestrian government, Clement amused. There was even an eye chart on the wall, but with nuts. He placed a hoof over one of his eyes, mimicking. Acorn, almond, walnut, cashew, peanut, another acorn. Velvet wrapped the healing potions in her magic and divided them amongst us. Keep these with you. In a place like this, it makes no sense for the only pony to be carrying all these supplies to be one. She then scooped up the rest into her medical boxes, save for a selection she had set aside for steel hooves. Turning to the outcast ranger, Velvety cautioned. Now I'm giving you what I can, including about half the painkillers. But Fluttershy didn't stock up on combat drugs, so I'm afraid you'll have to do without Buck or Dash, and whatever else you've been pumping into your body. She tisked. And we still need to find you your radiation pit as soon as we can, before you go tussling with anything too nasty. Stu was nickered, but said nothing, letting Velvet Remedy access the medical dispensary in his armor. Clemmy pulled out a few cans and boxes of food he had scavenged from a wall-mounted vendor. I felt a rumble in my gut as I realized I was starving. Two hundred-year-old snack cakes didn't sound too appetizing, but what Calamity put before us was all we had. We had left all of our provisions with Zenith and the starving zebras of Glyphmark. Y'all be thrilled to know that Fluttershy and her ministry were apparently all vegetarians, too, Calamity quipped. Velvet Remedy shot him a look. Calamity! I can't believe that even after Arbru, you would even consider thinking of eating meat. She pointed a hoof at me. Even little Pip has learned better. Gee, thanks, I muttered. Calamity shrugged. Spoken like some pony who ain't never tasted bacon. Damn. I had to admit, I was going to miss bacon. But after unwittingly eating another pony, I didn't think I could stomach it. Velvet neighed, eyes narrowing as she stepped towards the, Pegas towards the Pegasus, bringing them almost muzzle to muzzle. You know, sometimes I think the reason you didn't have much trouble with those cannibals, as we did, is because you like meat, and you don't see eating ponies as very far removed from eating rat hog. Calamity whined back, eyes narrowing in return. And sometimes, I think the reason y'all stable folk get all uppity about eating meat is because you can't see it being more in a step away from eating ponies. So much for eating. I watched helplessly as the two lovers glared at each other. Ponies are supposed to be vegetarians. Eating meat is a per... per... Uh, provision? Version? Perversion? That's the word. Every time you do it, you let the wasteland win a little. Nonsense. It's survival, Calamity countered. Hell, even eating ponies is a victimless crime. After all, they're dead. They don't care. It's only when pony folks start killing other ponies, and like the bastards in Arbru did, that I reckon they've done something wrong. More glaring. The air between them was so tense, I was waiting for something to explode, giving equal odds to them shooting each other or kissing. Finally, Velvet Remedy suggested in a low voice. Let's stay back away and just go to the next building before one of us says something he will regret. I reckon y'all say something you regret first. On the contrary. Enough! I shouted, unable to take the tension. I magically scooped up the uneaten food and dumped it into my saddlebags. Seriously, both of you! I stomped. To the next building. Calamity, you're with me in front. Velvet, you in the back. I grumbled, floating up our weapons and supplies. Goddesses, I can't take you two anywhere. <laughs> Pirate landed on a stew's battle saddle. I swear, that bird was laughing. We were halfway between the Ministry of Peace and the Ministry of Arcane Sciences when the Alicorn spotted us. She was standing on the roof of Twilight's Ministry, 
staring down at the walk below. At first, I had mistaken her for a carved statue. The whole ministry building had a vaguely alicorn motif. The knight of the ministry walk, chessboard. The dark blue stone was probably meant to honor Luna. The wall that encompassed the base of the building was a smooth marble with silver inlays <coughs> that embedded diamonds in the form of constellations. The sort of display that you'd expect from a tastelessly <clears throat> ostentatious observatory or a really bad dress. Even with the red lights on my EFS, I was legitimately surprised when what I thought was part of the architecture launched itself into the air and swooped down after us, her magic shield flickering to life around her. Krapow! I collapsed, clenching my ringing ears as the shot from Spitfire's thunder pierced the alicorn shield and tore through her neck, splattering her blood against the insides of her shield behind her. The shield flickered out as the alicorn plowed to the ground at our hooves. Velvet Randy moved towards me, dipping her head to nip my barding, helping back my hooves. As soon as I, had, I was standing, she backed away, saying something, but I couldn't hear her over the ringing in my ears. Comprehending my blank expression, she pointed a hoof to the field of Ministry Walk. I twisted. My EFS compass had filled with red lights. The shot had brought a lot of attention. Alicorns were beginning to look this way, a few of them already taking flight. She loose galloped past us, ignoring the Ministry buildings completely, firing missiles and rapid-fire grenades at the clusters of alicorns. The field of Ministry Walk erupted in dirt, smoke, and flame. Krapow! Krapow! Comedy fire spill fires thunder as quickly as the massive weapon would allow, taking aim at the shield alicorns while Steelers dashed through the thick pink pool, tearing apart those two slow to react with his patented level of massive overkill. One of the alicorns on the far side of the pink water reared up. I'll bring the head of the Pegasus to Night Seer myself, she launched into the air, her shield sparking to life around her. You off now? Comedy asked indignantly, his muzzle still biting down on Spitfire's thunder. Krapow! The shot passed through the heart of this flash of light. The alicorn had been an eye blink before. At the same instant, the dark purple monster appeared in another flash right behind Calamity. I charged, but with Remedy galloping beside me as I fired at Little Macintosh, the bullets sparking as they ricocheted off the alicorn's shield. The alicorn's horn glowed. And I slid to a stop, gasping as I watched blood from the crashed alicorn corpse beside Calamity float up, wrapped in the purple alicorn's magic, and begin to take shape. Calamity spun around, but the alicorn was too close. The barrel of Spitfire's thunder struck the shield, knocking out of Calamity's teeth. Velvet skidded to a stop, pressing her glowing horn against the alicorn's shield as she cast her anesthetic spell. The ball of light manifesting just inside the shield and striked the alicorn. The alicorn collapsed inside of her shield, her paralyzed body, but her magic still unhindered. The blood of the dead alicorn next to us solidified into a ruddy blade. The blood sword flew a calamity. He reared back, the blade slicing past him, leaving a shallow cut below his neck that wept blood. I could hear the whoosh of Steelhoof's rockets and the continuous thunder of a grenade machine gun. From the sound, he had switched to high explosive grenades in an effect to beat down an alicorn shield. The blood sword circled around, diving for Calamity's face. The Pegasus friend clamped down on the bit of his battle saddle, firing. The sword burst as he shot it out of the air. Y'all run ahead, Calamity shouted. I've got this one. He kicked up Zipfire's thunder and snatched the muzzle bit in his mouth. The paralyzed alicorn looked up at him from inside her shield. Eyes widening. Krapow! Velvet Remedy nudged me into the Ministry of Arcane Science building, then began to gallop towards herself. I quickly followed, Calamity covering our backs, and Steel Hooves, well, Steel Hooves seemed to have completely forgotten the rest of us. He was just bringing the mighty Alicorn Hunter, steel armored scourge of monsters in the Christian Wasteland. Calamity spun around as two more shielded alicorns drove out of the sky. He lifted Spitfire's thunder, taking aim. 
Oh, crap. Calamity's eyes widened. Deciding, there was no time to reload. The Pegasus turned tail, flying after us. The two alicorns swooped over the pool, their shields giving the pink water. They swerved broadly around Steel Hooves, giving him a wide berth. Steel Hooves tried to turn around to them, but he was far enough to manage to walk the reflected pool, but the watery pink sludge was impeding his movement. The alicorns left him behind, chasing after Calamity. Our multiple cracks of thunder, and the air lit up with bright flashes of several alicorns fired bolts of lightning into the reflected pool. Steel Hooves let out a deep-throated scream as arcs of electricity lashed through his armor, then collapsed into the water, vanishing beneath it. Damn it! I changed course, dropping our supplies behind me and running towards the water, dodging as I tried to make myself a difficult target. I searched for Steel Hooves in my EFS, but there was no light. Either he was dead again, or the super-saturated pink water was impairing my Pipex targeting spell. A wing of alicorns took flight, soaring over the violently sundered corpses of several of their sisters. A fourth cast another lightning bolt. The flash momentarily blinding me. I could feel heat and smell ozone as the bolt ripped through the air less than a yard from my body. I reached the edge of the pool and jumped, wrapping myself in magic and telekinetically flying over the pool, swerving as much as I could while keeping my head down looking for any trace of our fallen metal paladin. If I could just spot him, then I could wrap him in my levitation field, and... My head exploded. My horn felt like it was being cracked apart. Even as I screamed, I knew there was a broadcaster hidden in the water. I dropped, all four hooves splashing down in a thick pink sludge before I caught myself. My head was splitting open from the f effort. My horn felt like it was trying to screw itself into my head. I was certain that the necromantic energies were somehow focusing on the source of my magic. I had to find the broadcaster and get rid of it. No. I had to go up. Get away. I somehow noticed, awareness, that the alicorns were holding back. This was the same spot the others had veered around before. I thought that they were avoiding steel hooves, but even as I screamed in agony, I realized, be smart, that they had been avoiding the broadcaster. I could feel a new agony, a terrible burning in my hooves and legs. My spell imploded, and I dropped into the vacacious pink pool with a splash. My whole body was burning. I clamped my muzzle shut, thrusting um, involuntarily from the pain. If I drank it, even a little, I was surely dead. I forced myself to focus past the pain. I no longer wanted to get myself away from the pink pool or the broadcaster. I could no longer comprehend moving. Now, in utter desperation, I tried to get them away from me. With all the concentration I could manage, I wrapped the entire pool in magic and floated the water, the skeletons, everything that wasn't me up as high as I could. The super saturated pink pool of the reflected Cool. fell into the air. I looked up, gasping as the pink in my, pain in my horn and head receded. The burning faded, lingering most heavily on my right foreleg. I stood, shaking violently, flinging the pink water off my body until I felt dry, almost. Then I dared to open my eyes. The alicorns had flown back away from me, and the suddenly flying pool of water overhead. They stared and murmured to each other in voices that I could best describe as concerned. I looked up. In the last rays of twilight, I could see hundreds of small coins and bottle caps glistening along the bottom of the water. I could see skeletons floating in it, many of them fused together. I spotted steel hooves, his metal shod tail dangling down out of the liquid pink. I gingerly separated him from the liquid mass above me. I looked away to the way I had come. Calamity, Velvet Remedy, and Pyrolite were all staring with expressions trapped between screaming and cheering. I tried to gallop towards them, taking Steel Hooves with me, but searing agony shot up my right foreleg, and I fell to my face. My body had been through too much. It didn't want to cooperate anymore. 
But even through the dull pounding of my head, I was able to focus enough to wrap myself in magic. The pain in my head spiked. The throbbing, jumping in order of magnitude. But I slowly pushed myself back towards the edges of the pool and my friends. Still was in tow. Releasing more and more of the cloud saturated water as I left. The pink cloud poured down like a curtain behind me. I found myself starting to pass out. The effort of self hesitation was too taxing, and my body was screaming from abuse. Suddenly, I felt warm forelegs wrap around me. The calamity had flown out underneath the floating link of pink and was taking me to safety. He soared over the edge of the pool, just as my spell collapsed completely. I heard steel hooves drop into the field with a metallic thump. Melva turned and galloped towards him, her horn glowing. Calamity didn't stop, flying towards the entrance of the Ministry of Arcane Sciences. Hold on, Pip, he encouraged as he flew through the doors. And I was gone. I felt a moment of freefall. I think I even felt myself at the floor. Then, blackness. The Butterfly Orb The yellow carpeted floor raced under my feet. I could feel my nerves on edge. I found myself trapped in a small, utterly alien body as it darted between the hooves of scrambling, panicking ponies. A constant rumbling thunder filled the air. Mingling with cries and shouts of the ponies, I was scampering through as I raced down the aisles between cities of cubicles. A magenta pony spilled a shower of papers in front of me as she fled the room. One of the sheets slapped me in the face as I barreled through them. I made it through the offices and found myself changing, or charging down a huge, curving hallway, my little heart pounding in my chest. I heard a mare screaming from behind a set of mahogany doors. The voice was filled with rage and tears. How could they? How could they do this? I dashed for a little door built into the bottom of a very large one. A little door just about my size. They... they've ruined everything! They've c c killed everyone! The meeting room looked like it had been hit by a tornado. And it really had. A yellow and pink tornado in the form of Fluttershy. I burst into the room just in time to see her hurl a terminal through the glass of the seemingly gigantic picture window, shattering a large hole in it. The sound of impossible thunder amplified. Outside the window, I could see the sky shimmering and rippling with explosions as zebra missiles pounded against the princess's shields. Each impact brought a flash of fiery light splashing against the shield, the surface rippling outward like water around a dropped rock. Fluttershy stood on the table, shaking, stomping, her face streaming with tears and contorted in anger. She looked around for something else to throw, something else to break. I... I gave them life, and... and they... and they... I knew this room. I had just been there. The window had already begun to repair itself, the shattered hole growing smaller as if the spiderwebs of cracks thinned and shrunk. Ministry magic. The building was alive. It healed. I crept up onto a chair, and from there onto the table, rushing to Fluttershy's side. They... I... The poor Pegasus sobbed horribly, trembling on the verge of collapse. I did this. This is all my fault. I reached Fluttershy. Um, wrapping myself around her, wrapping around her forehoof, hugging her tight, trying to cover, comfort her. Oh! She looked down at me, and I felt her tears splash into my forehead. Oh, oh, Angel, what have I done? Every pony, all the helpless little critters, they're all going to die, and it's all my fault. Fluttershy toppled onto the table, burying her face, wailing. Beyond her, I saw the fateful writing, care. I held Fluttershy, stroking her anxiously, trying to help feeling terrible. She didn't deserve this. This wasn't her fault. Outside, the pounding thunder and violent light show continued. 
with a bang, the second set of mahogany doors opened at the front of the meeting room. Slammed, a white unicorn burst into a room. Her gorgeous purple mane and tail looked frazzled, and a beautiful saddle purse hung next to the three diamonds of her cutie mark. Fluttershy, Rarity called out, looking around and spotting the crumpled, weeping Pegasus. Oh, oh goodness. Rarity trotted up hurriedly. Fluttershy, darling, we have to go. She prodded at the sobbing, broken Pegasus. We only have half an hour before they're supposed to seal up Stable 1. We need to get inside. I couldn't tell her that it was probably already too late. Look, leave me, me, Fluttershy whimpered. You g g go, Rarity. Save yourself. I, I d deserve to die. Rubbish. Rarity poured her forehoof under Fluttershy's head, lifting her tear-streaked face. You deserve to live, probably more than the rest of us. I won't let you die here. R rare A tear dripped down one of Rarity's cheeks. I love you, Fluttershy, and I'm not going to let you stay. Rarity smiled softly, but her voice brooked no argument. Now, pull yourself up and come with me, or I'll drag you all the way there with my teeth. I looked between Fluttershy and Rarity, one paw still petting the yellow pegasus gently. Thwomp! All three of us turned towards the window. It had almost repaired itself, the hole now the size of a baseball. Outside, the shield continued to fluctuate under the massive, fiery barrage. Then we saw it, a thick, pink mist rolling over the city. It consumed block after block, floating down alleys and boiling over the tops of the buildings. Rarity let out a gasp as the thick, pink mist splashed against the towering Ministry of Image, breaking around it as if the wave of pink as the same wave of pink rolled over the Ministry of Arcane Technology, drowning it completely. I blinked, and the Ministries on the opposite side of the Ministry walk were gone. Then the trees were gone. The pink cloud washed over the gra grassy park, the reflecting pool, and all the panicking, terrified ponies below. The wall of pink rushed past us. The park was gone. Rarity gasped again, this time Spotting a hole in the window, she threw herself towards it. The trees were gone. Rarity slammed a forehoof in the hole. The wall of pink hid the Ministry of Peace. There was nothing outside the window anymore. The cracks that remained in the window began to warp and melt, fusing together. Rarity groaned in pain as she held her hoof firm against the hole, not letting the cloud get inside. R rare Rarity's eyes opened wide. She gazed at the window, whispering a low tone of comprehension. This is necromonic. Rarity turned to Fluttershy, who was staring at the window in horror. Forget Stable One, Fluttershy. I'm getting you to safety. With that, she focused her horn, glowing. A flash of light burst around Fluttershy, and the yellow pegasus was gone. I felt the worry and anger edge across my face. I scampered to Rarity and kicked at her. She looked down at me, her horn glowing again as she opened her saddle purse. Don't worry, Angel. I sent her someplace safe. I kicked at her impatiently. Ow! Okay, I sent her to Zakora's old hut in Neverfree Forest. Well, at least I got her very close to it. The zebras are attacking pony population centers. There are no ponies in that forest, so it's the only place I'm sure they will not attack. She smiled as she drew out the memory orb. Don't worry, Angel. I'll send you to her. But first, I need to leave a message for Twilight. Rarity stared down at me. Twilight, darling, I've sent Fluttershy away. And if I can, I'm going too. I don't want you teleporting around town looking for her. Ugh. Oh. Oh, this is bad. Rarity faltered. I could see even this small contact with the pink cloud was beginning to kill her. Don't look for us. Don't stay in Canterlot. But, but there is... Oh! Rarity thudded against the window weakly. Her hoof would have dropped away, but it couldn't anymore. It had become part of the glass. Listen, 
twilight, in my desk, in my office, there is a very special book. It's hidden in a secret compartment. You may be able to tear the, tear the desk apart to get it, but... Uh, but don't worry. I don't mind. Twilight is a spell book. And Rarity began to cough violently. And I believe it has the spell that can be used to... To defeat this necromancy. You... You must get that book. Rarity leaned against the glass. Her hoof supporting her weight now. Still, she floated the memory orb close to me. I realized suddenly why she'd been talking to me like I was Twilight Sparkle. My memory was going to be the message. Her horn glowed. Don't worry, Angel. This won't hurt. And as soon as I'm done, I'll send you to fly. I groaned. My whole body hated me for still being alive. My headache had ratcheted up to the point where it was hard to think straight. My right leg itched horribly beneath my pit buck. Everything else just hurt. Too much physical trauma in too short a period of time. My body was crying for me to stop. I'd lost count of how many times I'd been shot, beaten, poisoned. Wounds that would normally take weeks or even months to heal. Instead, I drowned myself in potions of magical healing, letting them mend everything, and then throwing myself back into the fray. Pain had become as much a companion as me, to me as my friends. But these things, the broadcasters, and the pink cloud, were so much worse. They tore me apart in ways a bullet never could. Attacking were at once, everywhere at once, attacking by my, my magic, attacking my brain. Even with potions of healing and restoration, I couldn't help but feel a deep and permanent damage were being done. I wasn't going to live into a ripe old age. One day, everything I had been putting my body through would catch up to me, and I would die young. Part of me wanted to quit while I was ahead, but every part of me knew that I could never quit. Quitting was surrender. I couldn't even rest, as much as I knew I should. Every day I rested was a day that others, whom I could have saved, would die. If I had rested even an hour, the young zebra who would have been slain by those blood wings. If I had rested an hour less, I would have been able to save his friends as well. Pain, I could handle. As long as I was alive, I was still able to make a difference. I wondered if this was how Steelhoofs felt. I'd saved him. He hadn't been moving, but I knew he wouldn't be dead. The lightning may have rendered him unconscious, or knocked his armor's spell matrix offline. Either way, if I hadn't gotten to him, the Alicorns would have. The broadcaster wouldn't have saved him, although it definitely brought him time. Thanks to goddesses, I had at least managed to levitate the liquid pink sludge away f from... away before I had inhaled any of it. Thanks to Lusty and Luna, I hadn't drunk healing potions minutes earlier, and didn't fall into the pool with open wounds from those Cantalot dragon hatchlings. I couldn't tell if I had been supremely lucky or supremely unlucky. And, now that I think of it, I'd come out of it with a new weapon against the Alicorns. Granted, one that was indiscriminately lethal, but it had to be possible to use the broadcasters to my advantage. But first, I needed to... Where the hell was I? Calamity? Velvet Remedy? I was alone. Steel Hooves? Pyrolite? Completely alone. I was laying on a soft cushioned bed. I tried to sit up, and a thunderclap went off at my pounding head, knocking me back down and leaving tears in my eyes. I brought up my EFS, not remembering turning it off, and scanned the medical warnings. I needed to drink a super restoration potion, possibly several, and painkillers. I needed painkillers. I didn't have any. I didn't have anything. No weapons, no supplies. I vaguely remember dropping our weapons and supply packs when I went chasing after steel hooves. I groaned a little at the thought of little Macintosh lying abandoned out on the field. I felt like I had lost a friend. Hopefully Velvet Remedy grabbed everything before following us. 
but doing so would have been taxing for her limited telekinesis, and I couldn't imagine her prioritizing weapons when she had steel hooves to care for. But I wasn't wearing my utility art barding either, and I definitely didn't strip down before my unintentional swim. I felt truly naked as I realized I didn't even have my hacking tools. Looking around, I was in a library. No, an anathenium. And a big one. Even bigger than Twilight Sparkle's anathenium in Tenpony Tower. I remember the recording that Homage had played for me, Rarity talking to Twilight. I've just heard the Ministry is about to purge the Ponyville Library of ideologically incompatible books, and I knew right away that you'd want to keep them for yourselves. So, I know the Ministry of Magic of Ministry Walk has a much bigger library, but we can't get away with diverting those wagons to Canterlot, now can we? If only I could spare the time to just sit and read. Ah, you're awake. The voice startled me. I was... it was... it was urbane. The voice of a gentle stallion. I looked around, wincing as pain in my head amplified with a sudden movement, blurring my vision. Good morning, ma'am. Morning? Oh, goddesses. I'd been asleep all night, and no pony had found me? This was unspeakably bad. Who are you? I asked the stranger. Where am I? Wordsworth, at your service, ma'am. You are in Twilight Sparkles and Athenium, ma'am. I blinked away tears, turning my head more slowly as I began to mentally hone in on the source of the voice. There it was. Or it, rather. A mechanical owl. A much fancier version of the one that I had seen following the merchant who had set up in the remains of Trixie's cottage. I remembered floating a fighting owl similar to this one in the Ministry of Mor Morales hub in Manhattan, too. But this one looked more sophisticated, and more lovingly crafted, down to the bronze uh, lacing of his feathers. Who? What? Are you? At least this mechanical owl, owl didn't seem hostile. Wordsworth, ma'am. Twilight Sparkles, Junior, 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 Assistant. How did I get here? Well, ma'am, the owl said, sounding embarrassed. When a mare and a stallion love each other, or have a certain binding contract, I interrupted quickly. Into this room, I mean. The point in the back of my head was blinking. Certain binding contracts? But then, it was Canterlot, home of nobility and royalty. You were teleported here, ma'am. Security protocols. The ministry is under lockdown. All visitors and staff are teleported to proper areas, and intruders are remanded to secure containment areas. Cells. He meant cells. The itching under my pit buck was driving me crazy. Further questions revealed that the lockdown had been running constantly since the environmental catastrophe over 200 years ago. Furthermore, all the teleportation zones were inside the ministry building. But Wordsworth, Wordsworth couldn't tell me where any of the others had been sent. Neither could the owl give a satisfactory explanation of how I had how I had rated teleportation into Twilight Sparkle's private library. I got the sense that the security system wasn't functioning quite right in the way it was supposed to. It had degraded under centuries of continuous operation. I was probably lucky I hadn't been teleported into a bookshelf or a wall. And what of my clothing? All foreign objects bearing trace amounts of toxins were teleported to sanitation. I really hope that didn't mean incineration. I would like them back, please. Certainly, ma'am, Wordsworth responded pleasantly. Sanitation has been completed. They will be returned to the wardrobe immediately. Another fear shot through me. If this magical security system stripped me of my armor, then would it try to strip steel hooves of his? Or would it recognize something melded to him as integral? That was, assuming Velvet Remedy, was able to fit him to the safety of the Ministry building. My mind conjured the alarming image of Velvet Remedy running into the Ministry, levitating steel hooves behind her, 
and let me be teleported away, leaving steel hooves helplessly outside the doorstep. If it was inside, and still here, and alive, for those definitions of alive that included Cantalot ghouls, then he was separated like the rest of us. My friends could be anywhere in the building. Again, I remembered that they had all night to try to find me. The fact that had, they hadn't most likely meant they were in bad shape. I moaned and tried to sit up again. My EFS was still flashing health alerts at me. I looked at my pit buck to check the auto map, wishing all my friends were pit bucks so I could just locate their tags. Of course, that's exactly the problem that got me into this whole mess a month ago and a half, wasn't it? I looked at my foreleg and stopped breathing. I wasn't wearing my pit buck anymore. Where the metal device should have stopped and my flesh started, it didn't. Instead, they melted seamlessly together into one another. I felt sick looking at it. I had been so casual to dismiss the possible danger before, but now that it actually happened, I felt a sense of violation and loss that I couldn't explain. I just... I just wasn't me anymore. I dropped back onto the bed and curled up into a ball and cried. Wordsworth, I whispered several minutes later as I tried to fight back the hollow feeling in my heart. I need medical supplies. Any painkiller, healing, and restoration potions you can give me? You would not prefer to use the Autonomous healing booths, ma'am? The what now? Okay, yes. Where is the healing booth? Never again. I felt better, physically, than I had in weeks. Psychologically, I was shaken to the point of collapse. The healing booth was a solid metal tube, barely larger than any pony. Stepping into it had been like stepping into my own coffin. The air that had been stifling even before the door stood closed behind me plunged me into darkness. I'd never felt claustrophobic before. If anything, I was prone to sudden onsets of agoraphobia. But in that metal casket, in the absolute darkness, with the sounds that horrible thing made... And then I had started to feel the magical energies bobbing through me, watching over me as if some sort of slimy, alien message from an invisible and horrible creature. Never, ever, again. Even though my body felt better, I knew I would have nightmares for weeks. I could already anticipate waking in a cold sweat, feeling the dream terror of being trapped endlessly in that autonomous healing station. It had worked perfectly as it was supposed to, and yet manticores couldn't drag me back into one if I was on the edge of death. I shuddered to imagine the horror of one of these things could inflict if it wasn't functioning properly. If it malfunctioned or suffered uh, degradation from the cloud, I felt myself shiver. The walls were covered with a soft, velvety cloth, burgundy in color with sparkling accents. They gave a, the hallway a rich, luxurious feel. Oil paintings hung on the walls. I passed a spot where a large oval of dark cloth portrayed or betrayed the removal of what had previously been a portrait. Ahead of me, the hallway ended in a door marked spell testing. Some pony had sprawled the words spell in a box on the door in what looked like dried blood. From the end of the X, the blood streaked down to meet at a dark stain on the floor. Not a good sign, I muttered to myself. I was appropriately creeped out. As I approached, I could faintly hear the hissing sound coming from behind it, like a hundred dying snakes. I stopped, psyching myself up, taking deep breaths, and opening the door from a distance to my own magic. Through it, I could see another door at the far end of the laboratory. One more deep breath, and I broke into a run. I galloped through the doorway and into the lab, my ears filling with a sound of static. The headache that the healing station had rid me of returned with a passion, accompanied by a familiar pressure in my horn. I didn't have a firearm, no way to take out the speaker, 
I just had to get through the lab and out of his range before he could kill me. Blood began to tint my vision as I reached the opposite door. It was locked. I telekinetically fumbled with the lock, the pain in my horn escalating, the deadly effect of the broadcaster tearing my brain. I spent nearly an hour in the healing station, and for the first time since leaving Ten Pony, I actually felt healthier. I had been allowed to enjoy the sensation for less than 40 minutes. I unlocked the door and pushed it open, stepping out of the lab and outside the speaker's kill zone. I panted, leaning against a railing, blinking away blood and tears. Then I looked down into the grand hall, lined with sweeping staircases. Below me was a fountain similar to the one in Homage's foyer, only the statue here was of two identical unicorn mares frolicking. On the walls to each side of the oil were oil paintings, including a royal portrait of a smiling, green-coated unicorn mare with a darker green mane. Hanging opposite was what appeared to be the same mare, only with the colors of her coat and mane swapped. Velvet? I called out. Calamity? Any pony home? My voice echoed in the strange the empty corridor. At the end of the grand hall, in the crux of multiple stairwells that spread out like butterfly wings, was of important looking high arched set of double doors flanked by unicorn busts. I was unsurprised that they were locked. I was very surprised when the moment I started to pick the locks, two magical energy turrets dropped down and started shooting at me. I was immediately thankful for my armored utility barding had been returned as I spun and dove over the railing of the nearest stairwell, catching myself with levitation as soon as I was behind cover. I suppose I considered myself lucky that my barding hadn't been submerged in the pink pool long enough to fuse my body, and that my hacking and repair tools had likewise not been fused together or otherwise warped into uselessness. Having my pitbuck melted in my arm was a brutal enough blow, and I had never wanted to take it off. Yeah, that would have made my relationship with Homage really difficult, my little pony teased. I shushed her, annoyed, and turned my focus to unlocking the door from safety. It was proving a tough lock, but I only faced one tougher already the day. I saw a purple flash from above me and heard a cackle, or a crackle, this door of magical t defenses beyond the turrets. I had just been trying this when my trusty screwdriver and bobby pin would have been in a bad state. I'm sorry. Click. Yes! I eased myself onto the floor, turning my focus to the fountain. The glow of my magic washed over the pooled water. I lifted the water in the air, using it to shield me overhead as I galloped back to the stairs. The magical energy turn spotted me and started to fire each shot evaporating, part of my shield, in a poof of steam. By the time I got through the door, it was barely enough to fill a wastebasket. I was so thankful there weren't any more turrets waiting inside. Instead, I found myself in what I quickly deduced was the head researcher's office. Bookshelves, filing cabinets, tapestries, arcane spellwork tables. The room was laid out sy uh, <clears throat> symmetrically around a carpet with an uh, intricate star pattern of alternating colors. Two rather impressive desks face each other, with oil paintings of the same green ponies hung on the walls behind them. Not portraits this time, but full paintings, which allowed me to see their matching cutie marks. Spiraling magical sparks entwined with each other. On each desk sat a terminal next to glass placard with a name sealed inside making out a made out of sparkling glitter. Gestalt and Mosaic. Mosaic? I don't know. Turning around the desk, I spotted a weapon display case and several ammo boxes. Inside the display case was a magical plasma rifle and a multi-gem magical energy shotgun. The latter reminded me of God's gun. It took me less than a minute to make them mine. I was tempted to run back upstairs and shoot them damn, that damn death speaker, but it wasn't very good with magical energy weapons, but I was sure I could take out a stationary target at close range. 
Moving to Mosaic's terminal, I drew out my tools and began to hack it. Mercifully, the pink saturated water that bound my pit buck to me did not seem to impair its functioning. The stable tech didn't fool around when they made pit bucks. The device had a durability somewhere between steel hooves and a soul jar. <laughs>